Okay, let's go ahead and get started with Grand Rounds this morning. It's uh, my pleasure to uh, welcome one of our chief uh, residents, uh, Dr. Vincent Kirkpatrick. Uh, Dr. Kirkpatrick uh, grew up in California, just north of San Francisco, tough life. Uh, went to undergraduate at UCLA and went to medical school at UC Irvine. Uh, then came here for his residency, went back uh, and did two years of vascular surgery research uh, at UC uh, Irvine. Uh, and then uh, will be completing his uh, residency here in June and is going uh, for minimally invasive. In Orlando. In Orlando. Uh, please help me welcome Dr. Kirkpatrick. Good morning, everyone. So I'm going to talk about uh, pneumoperitoneum, which for the medical students, in case you don't know, is insufflating, uh, inflating the abdominal cavity with gas in order to perform laparoscopic and robotic surgery. I'm going to talk about the downsides of that and the negative impacts that can have on patients. I have no disclosures. Uh, a little bit of the overview. So first we'll talk about the history of the establishment of pneumoperitoneum and laparoscopy. We'll talk about the type of gas used and the pathological effects that arise from the gas itself. Uh, we'll talk about the optimal gas pressure that's used to maintain pneumoperitoneum. And then we'll talk about pathological effects due to the pressurization of the peritoneal cavity and all the different organ systems that are uh, generally affected by that. Uh, so some of the first pneumoperitoneum uh, that was uh, investigated was uh, originally attributed in 1901 to Dr. Kelling, who used a cystoscope and insufflated the abdominal cavity of dogs in order to tamponade bleeding. Dr. Varus, a name that many will recognize for the needle, which is used to insufflate, did some work in the 1930s um, uh, to establish pneumoperitoneum. Also, Dr. Palmer, uh, a gynecologist, developed many techniques in France. Uh, many people might have heard of Palmer's Point, which is uh, considered a safe place to uh, induce pneumoperitoneum with a varus needle, which is in the mid-clavicular line just below the costal margin, uh, was uh, pioneered by him. Also, Dr. Hassan, uh, for whom the Hassan uh, trocar was named, shown in the picture, he was a gynecologist in Chicago in the 1970s, and he developed many laparoscopic techniques for dealing with uh, ovarian and other gynecological disease. The first laparoscopic appendectomy is attributed to uh, German gynecologist Dr. Kurt Sem, shown in the picture, who performed this in 1983. He developed many techniques, including an insufflator device and uh, laparoscopic loop knots to be used uh, for the procedure. And the first laparoscopic cholecystectomy is attributed to a German, Dr. Muhe, whose original uh, paper was scoffed at when he presented it in Munich uh, shortly after, and his work would not go recognized until several years later. He was amazingly able to perform the first laparoscopic cholecystectomy in two hours. So which gas is optimal for uh, the establishment of pneumoperitoneum? The standard that we use here and in most centers is carbon dioxide. It's cheap. It's non-combustible. It doesn't explode with uh, sparking or with cautery. It's also soluble. Um, the downsides are it can cause hypercarbia and acidosis, which we'll talk about later. Other gases which have been studied uh, include nitrous oxide, which has anesthetic properties. It is combustible, and there have been rare cases of explosions that have been reported. Lastly, there's helium, which is non-combustible, but it's more expensive and it's not as soluble. So a 2013 meta-analysis of different gases used for the establishment of pneumoperitoneum uh, really focused on these three that I mentioned. Um, of the seven trials 
uh, that were in the study, even though these were the best trials in the literature, they were all judged at high risk of bias, namely because the <coughs> investigating surgeons were aware of the randomization groups and could potentially be biased in reporting and collecting of the data. Uh, they noted that nitrous oxide was associated with decreased postoperative pain in two of the three trials, which is not surprising because it is a uh, general anesthetic. Um, and it was not associated with any adverse events in these uh, trials. <clears throat> helium was associated with fewer hemodynamic changes, which we'll discuss later, although this did not translate into any uh, clinical benefit. And there were also three adverse events noted um, of subcutaneous emphysema, which is not surprising because this gas is less soluble than the other two. And their conclusions from this meta-analysis was that the safety of these other two gases, nitrous oxide and helium, uh, has yet to be established, and there's a need for additional randomized controlled trials with less bias. So let's talk about uh, the pathophysiology of insufflating the abdominal cavity with uh, carbon dioxide, or capnoperitoneum. Uh, as it relates to acid-base disturbances. So carbon dioxide is a soluble gas, and it's in equilibrium in the blood and plasma with bicarbonate. Um, one study showed that pneumoperitoneum uh, increases the partial pressure of uh, CO2 within five minutes of insufflation in healthy individuals. Normally, uh, the anesthesiologists can uh, compensate for this with increased ventilation. However, under certain circumstances, such as uh, severe pulmonary disease uh, or cardiac disease, uh, this may not be possible. And when it's not, hypercarbia can occur, which has several effects that can be harmful, including vasodilation, decreased myocardial contractility, arrhythmias, and worsening pulmonary hypertension. Uh, another rare event that can occur with pneumoperitoneum is gas embolism, which is uh, escape of gas from the peritoneal cavity into the venous system and into the heart. <clears throat> There's not a lot of data on it, and the incidence varies widely from 0.0014% to 0.6%. And actually, one study of prostatic surgeries, they uh, placed a... Uh, transesophageal probe in and monitored the heart for all uh, of their cases. And in a series of 43 laparoscopic prostatectomies, 17% developed gas emboli. Um, none of these uh, were symptomatic. Uh, these were essentially subclinical emboli, but it shows you just how uh, prevalent this can be. Um, now, when gas embolism becomes severe, uh, the manifestations include uh, severe hypotension, tachycardia, and oxygen desaturation. It's mostly a clinical diagnosis, but you may hear a mill wheel cardiac murmur as the air in the right ventricle is uh, churned with blood. Um, and it can be diagnosed with a uh, transesophageal echocardiogram if you're lucky enough to have one in at the time. The treatment is to stop CO2 insufflation, place the patient in left lateral decubitus and Trendelenburg position, administer 100% oxygen, and you may attempt to uh, aspirate gas from the right atri from the right ventricle uh, with a central line. So what insufflation pressure is optimal? I think to look at this, we should look at what is the high end of what is safe. The World Society of Abdominal Compartment Syndrome has defined intra-abdominal hypertension as anything over 12 millimeters of mercury of pressure. And the compartment syndrome itself is defined as an abdominal pressure of 20 with organ dysfunction. Most of the studies on pneumoperitoneum use pressures of 16 millimeters or lower. So there have been several randomized trials comparing uh, standard pressure pneumoperitoneum with lower pressure, which in my opinion are not well designed. There was a meta-analysis of all of these, uh, 21 of them, and they judged the quality of the evidence was low overall. Um, the difference between the two pressure groups in conversion to open surgery for laparoscopic cholecystectomy was the same. <clears throat> 
the adverse events were the same. Uh, the operating time was two minutes longer in the low pressure group. Um, of note, and the main problem with these studies is that most of these patients were low risk elective cholecystectomies, and you wouldn't expect a lower gas to be beneficial across the board in elective cholecystectomies. You would expect it to be beneficial in uh, patients with uh, high cardiac risk, pulmonary disease, in whom high pressures are going to be more harmful. And the conclusion of this study was that low insufflation pressures are generally feasible, but there's no evidence of superiority. And the problem with it is that it can make surgical exposure more difficult, which can make you potentially more prone to injuries and other problems. So more trials are needed, but for now we'll stick with the pressure of uh, 15 or, or 16. Uh, I'll note there is a kind of an archaic uh, technique for uh, creation of an abdominal working space uh, that's not open surgery. It's called abdominal wall lift. I saw a couple papers cite this. And uh, essentially, it's a mechanical technique where you apply external force to the abdominal wall to elevate it as opposed, in contrast to pneumoperitoneum, where you're insufflating from the inside. Um, there was a meta-analysis performed of all the trials comparing these two techniques uh, done in 2013. And essentially, there were no significant differences uh, in these groups when they're looking at laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Um, the, the operative time was a little bit longer in the abdominal wall lift group. And their conclusion was abdominal wall lift offers no advantage over pneumoperitoneum. Again, it's, these studies were mostly done on low-risk patients, um, so it's not going to be very uh, insightful. So what are the cardiovascular effects of pneumoperitoneum? Uh, that can be harmful. So uh, insufflating the abdominal cavity causes compression of the inferior vena cava, which can lead to decreased venous return and reduction of cardiac preload and cardiac output. This is why it is important to judiciously maintain euvolemia uh, in patients during laparoscopic surgery, especially those patients with uh, fragile uh, hearts or pulmonary conditions. Uh, Pneumoperitoneum also increases mean arterial pressure and systemic vascular resistance, and it's related to aortic compression as well as neuroendocrine stimulation. In other words, catecholamine release, uh, which we'll talk about in just a bit as well. Uh, lastly, uh, stretching of the pneumoperitoneum with insufflation stimulates vagal afferent nerves, increases vagal tone, and can cause bradyarrhythmias, even asystole. In one study of a young, healthy population undergoing pneumoperitoneum, bradyarrhythmia has developed surprisingly in 14 to 27 uh, percent. None of them were significant. Uh, preoperative beta blockers can actually worsen this, obviously. Um, when this does occur, you should try using a slower insufflation rate, consider decreased pressure, and you can premedicate with glycopyrrolate, which is an uh, anticholinergic. Uh, um, medication that can blunt vagal tone. So when bradyarrhythmias occur, uh, you, the treatment of that is immediate desufflation of the abdominal cavity. So if you're operating a uh, laparoscopic cholecystectomy and maybe on an older gentleman and they go into a bradyarrhythmia, uh, that's the first thing you do. You open up all the ports and evacuate the gas. Um, so after you, after this happens, it's usually safe to attempt a second try if, as long as the patient recovers and you discuss with the anesthesiologist. But if not, then you should consider canceling the case or conversion to open surgery. Patients who have congestive heart failure are at particular risk with pneumoperitoneum, and they can progress to cardiogenic shock if not managed appropriately. The management of uh, patients with CHF who undergo uh, pneumoperitoneum includes optimal uh, volume status with uh, use of diuretics preoperatively and avoiding excessive uh, fluid administration intraoperatively. Um, hypertension is particularly harmful and can uh, pro uh, progress to, it can cause cardiogenic shock. Also, high insufflation pressures are going to uh, cause more 
um, uh, impairment of uh, cardiac preload and are more harmful. So any patient with uh, CHF should undergo consultation with a cardiologist prior to surgery, and there should be consideration for open surgery. So what are the pulmonary effects of pneumoperitoneum? So pneumoperitoneum creates upward pressure on the diaphragm, and that's going to increase overall airway pressures, especially in, in uh, surgeries in which you need uh, the Trendelenburg or head down position where all the viscera are uh, mechanically also pushing down on the diaphragm. <coughs> it results in reduction in pulmonary compliance and an increase in airway pressures. In healthy patients, this probably doesn't matter much, but in certain populations, especially the uh, morbidly obese uh, who already have elevated airway pressures and decreased compliance, it can be uh, very relevant. It also decreases functional residual capacity. Um, hypercarbia, as we know, can uh, cause pulmonary artery vasoconstriction and can cause uh, shunting and uh, perfusion ventilation mismatch, um, in, especially in patients with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Um, so in patients with COPD, uh, the laparoscopy can pose a challenge. Um, acidosis can occur, pulmonary hypertension can occur, um, and also because of their uh, uh, non-compliant lungs, um, higher air pressures are needed to achieve adequate ventilation, and these, many of these patients have blebs or bully present, and this can result in rupture of the, of the bully. Uh, if a patient with COPD intraoperatively does develop refractory acidosis, uh, urgent conversion to open surgery should be performed until the uh, gases can be corrected. So uh, the neuroendocrine effects of neuroperitoneum, by neuroendocrine I mean the, um, especially the catecholamines response of pneumoperitoneum. So there was a study done here uh, by Dr. Serenik et al. They looked at 23 patients who were undergoing elective laparoscopic cholecystectomy, and they divided them into two groups, the uh, open group and a laparoscopic group. They measured catecholamine concentrations, cortisol and glucose, preoperatively, intraoperatively, and then postoperatively over several hours, and uh, they compared them statistically. Uh, so the open group had significantly higher uh, increase in levels of stress hormones, although the, the laparoscopic group also had a significant increase from baseline. In the laparoscopic group, they returned to normal after four to five hours. However, in the open group, they main, uh, remained elevated up to nine hours, which is as far as they, they checked them. And the conclusion was that the laparoscopic approach uh, induces significantly less of a stress response that lasts for a shorter duration compared to open surgery. Uh, and these findings have been duplicated in a Greek study, which also uh, checked the uh, mediators of CRP and IL-6, which had the same pattern. Here's a, uh, a uh, diagram from this study, from the Serenik et al. study, showing total catecholamine concentration. Um, you can see the open cholecystectomy group is the curve on the top, and the laparoscopic group is on the bottom, and you can see there's clearly a, a difference in the uh, amplitude of increase in catecholamines, and there's a, a faster uh, downtrend in the laparoscopic group. So related to this is the sympathetic response of pneumoperitoneum. Um, so one uh, group in China studied um, blockage of the stellate ganglion with uh, local anesthetic. <laughs> stellate ganglion is a sympathetic ganglion in the inferior neck that sends out many sympathetic efferent fibers to both the heart and the uh, blood vessels causing vasoconstriction, increased heart rate, and so forth. Um, they did a randomized study of 68 elderly patients uh, who were undergoing elective cholecystectomy, and half of the group underwent stellate ganglion blockade, and the other half did not. And then intraoperatively, they measured mean arterial pressure, heart rate change, catecholamine levels, and cortisol. They found that in the group that had stellate ganglion blockade, there was significant reduction in all of these um, metrics 
uh, compared to the control group that were statistically significant. Uh, and the conclusion is essentially that laparoscopic cholecystectomy, one, does induce a significant sympathetic response, and two, it can be successfully blunted by stellate ganglion blockade. This may be relevant to patients with significant uh, cardiovascular disease who are at risk of arrhythmias uh, during pneumoperitoneum. Uh, this could be a viable technique to, uh, to blunt that or to avoid that. Getting a little bit more obscure, but also relevant. So visual impairment after non-ophthalmologic surgery uh, it is rare. The most common surgeries in which it occurs in is cardiac surgery and spinal fusion. Uh, appendectomy is much more rare. And the uh, common pathway for this is a reduction in ocular perfusion. Ocular perfusion pressure uh, is, as we know, a, uh, the mean arterial pressure minus the intraocular pressure. So one, there was one uh, study that looked at intraocular pressure during laparoscopy. Uh, in 40 African patients. So they measured, so they selected a group of African patients who had no known intraocular hypertension beforehand and were otherwise healthy and were undergoing elective laparoscopic surgery. And they measured the intraocular pressures before the surgery and at several points during the course of the operation, one after the induction of anesthesia and then two after the um, creation of pneumoperitoneum and then postoperatively. So they found that intraocular pressure increased only very mildly in this, uh, in this group of patients by 2.8 uh, millimeters of mercury in the reverse Trendelenburg uh, position and by 0 0.4 in the Trendelenburg position, which is a little unusual because you'd expect it to be the other way around. You'd expect the Trendelenburg to have higher, but in any case, it wasn't a very impressive increase in intraocular pressure and none of the patients went into the glaucoma range of pressures, which is over 21 millimeters of mercury. In addition, induction of general anesthesia lowers the IO piece, the intraocular pressure, so it kind of balanced out. Um, other studies have shown that the Trendelenburg position may be more <coughs> relevant in inducing intraocular hypertension. Um, so the conclusion from this study is that pneumoperitoneum is not likely to contribute significantly to intraocular hypertension and to uh, visual impairment after uh, laparoscopic surgery. Um, so what is the effect of pneumoperitoneum on renal function? So most of the data on this come from animal studies. Uh, there is a meta-analysis done of 55 of these animal studies on a variety of species, and they found that uh, the induction of pneumoperitoneum uh, does, uh, one, decrease blood flow to the kidney um, temporarily, which recovers uh, postoperatively. Um, it also decreases urine output um, in the acute phase. Uh, one study uh, it used uh, N-acetylcysteine, um, which they gave to rats, beforehand, before inducing pneumoperitoneum, and they found that this blunted the impairment of renal effect, suggesting that uh, it may be related to the generation of free radicals, as in reperfusion injury. Uh, human data is much more scarce on this topic. The best uh, data it comes from a randomized control trial of 104 patients who were assigned to either laparoscopic or open gastric bypass. Um, they measured urine output and BUN and creatinine uh, postoperatively. Uh, despite the fact that both groups had the, uh, a statistically uh, similar uh, amount of IV fluids administered, uh, the laparoscopic group had a significantly lower urine output, 64% lower, during the intraoperative period. Uh, however, uh, this was not accompanied by any change in uh, BUN or creatinine in the postoperative period, and patients appeared to recover just fine without any long-term effects. Uh, their conclusion was that pneumoperitoneum causes a transient decrease in urine output, but it's not, it does not result in any lasting renal injury, and renal function appears to normalize preoperatively, I mean postoperatively. Um, so pneumoperitoneum also um, puts pressure on other organ systems, including the pelvic veins. 
which has been studied. So remember that the, uh, the factors that contribute to venous thrombosis are hypercoagulability, endothelial injury, and venous stasis. It's Virchow's triad. So pneumoperitoneum uh, exacerbates the latter, venous stasis. Also, uh, reverse Trendelenburg position uh, also contributes to this. So uh, surgeries of the pelvis, such as rectal, uh, urologic, and gynecologic surgeries that require reverse Trendelenburg uh, are at the highest risk of uh, causing venous stasis and uh, thrombosis. <clears throat> um, so one group looked at this and tried to quantify this. Uh, they had 30 patients who were randomized uh, to go open versus laparoscopic uh, gastric bypass. They measured uh, peak uh, femoral vein systolic velocities as their metric of uh, venous stasis. They also measured the uh, diameter at the femoral canal of the, of the femoral vein. They measured it preoperatively, and they measured it after the um, induction of pneumoperitoneum, and then after SCDs, or sequential compression devices, were placed, and they compared them. And they also compared laparoscopic versus open. So you can see the chart here that the, the laparoscopic group, this is the baseline um, <clears throat> peak systolic velocities, and the black bar is with sequential compression devices, the gray bar is without. So you can see that the higher velocity means the uh, blood flow in the vein is, is good and healthy and normal. So you can see a baseline. The SCD group has uh, significantly higher than the non-SCD group. Then with the induction of pneumoperitoneum, or PP, you can see a significant decline here in the peak systolic velocity. In other words, the venous blood is uh, moving much slower due to back pressure on the iliac veins. And then when the re reverse Trendelenburg position was uh, created, um, it dropped even further. In the open group, uh, obviously they didn't do pneumoperitoneum, but the, there was a drop from um, the baseline to the reverse Trendelenburg, which was significant. So to quantify it, the peak systolic velocity um, in de decrease uh, from the pneumoperitoneum decreased to 57% of baseline with, uh, with the induction of pneumoperitoneum, which sounds pretty significant. And when you add reverse Trendelenburg, it goes down to 43%. The SCDs partially improved this back up to 62% from 43%. Um, in the open bypass group, uh, findings were uh, somewhat similar. Um, I also mentioned that they measured femoral ring circumference, and this essentially followed the same trend. <coughs> so there's a, a similar study uh, that looked at laparoscopic cholecystectomy patients, um, 50 of them who were randomized to uh, SCD placement or not. So the, the, the compression devices or not. So half of them got them and half of them didn't. They also measured the peak femoral vein velocity. Um, and they found that in the SCD group, the peak systolic velocity was unchanged from baseline after the creation of pneumoperitoneum. In other words, SCDs were able to compensate for the venous stasis caused by pneumoperitoneum. However, in the group without SCDs, the velocity decreased by 61%. So if you combine this with the previous trial, I think we should conclude that pneumoperitoneum and reverse Trendelenburg cause significant venous stasis. And in non-obese patients, uh, this can be reversed with SCDs. But in the uh, bariatric group of patients, the SCDs only partially reverses the venous stasis, which stresses the importance of um, pay paying attention to venous stasis in the morbidly obese population in consideration for um, chemical uh, DVT prophylaxis should be considered. Uh, so pneumoperitoneum can also have harmful effects on hepatic function. Um, shown here are some uh, figures from a laparoscopic, uh, a, a trial of uh, laparoscopic cholecystectomy in which patients were randomized to laparoscopic versus open 
and they measured uh, baseline liver function and then at 24 hours and 72 hours postoperatively. These were all elective cholecystectomies uh, in healthy patients. Um, if you look at the laparoscopic group on the left, um, it's harder to see the bilirubin group, but if you look at AST, uh, you can see that from the baseline to the 24-hour uh, post-operative values, there is a significant increase from about a value of around high 20s to the 70s. And then this dropped down to, at 72 hours post-operative, this dropped basically down to baseline. ALT and AST both uh, look about the same in that aspect. And if you look at this one, it's, it also has a similar pattern. In other words, baseline, it jumps post-operative 24 hours later and then returns to baseline 72 hours later. Alkaline phosphatase didn't follow this pattern as much. And you compare this to the open group in which all of these values uh, are, are essentially the same. Uh, AST doesn't really change postoperatively, and nor does ALT or ALP. So the conclusion is essentially that pneumoperitoneum causes uh, significant measurable changes in, in liver function. Uh, this doesn't really translate into any clinical importance, uh, except that um, I think there's a learning point, especially for younger residents and, and interns that often would check liver function tests after a cholecystectomy in patients who spend the night. And they're, they're almost always elevated. And I think the learning point here is that this is kind of an expected finding that the liver function test will be elevated after, after a laparoscopic cholecystectomy, even when everything goes normally on elective patients. Uh, it's likely related to decreased splanchnic blood flow uh, from the pneumoperitoneum, which we'll talk about now. Um, so animal studies of hepatic function in pneumoperitoneum. So there was a study of uh, 24 dogs that they randomized into uh, four different groups, including a control group. Um, the, so the control group only underwent general anesthesia, and the other three groups underwent pneumoperitoneum at different pressures, 7 millimeters of mercury, 12, and the standard 15, which we use uh, for most cases here. And uh, their findings were similar to ours, I mean similar to the prior studies. Uh, they found elevation of of GGT, ALKFOS, and ALT um, that were elevated in the groups who went underwent pneumoperitoneum compared to baseline. They did compare the highest insufflation pressure to the lowest insufflation pressure group to see if the magnitude of elevation in LFTs was different, and it, it wasn't. Or it was, but it wasn't statistically significant. And their conclusion was that uh, pneumoperitoneum, even without concomitant surgery, uh, can elevate liver function. So how does pneumoperitoneum impair hepatic function? Uh, it's probably related to uh, decreased portal vein flow uh, from pressure of the uh, pneumoperitoneum gas on the portal vein itself. One uh, study of human patients um, undergoing uh, elective uncomplicated cholecystectomy, they applied a Doppler probe to the portal vein and they measured <coughs> velocities of flow uh, in the portal vein. So the first bar is the baseline portal vein velocities in this study and the mean velocity was 990 milliliters per minute of flow. After induction of pneumoperitoneum, this uh, exhibited a significant drop down to 568 millimeters, uh, milliliters per minute. And this was at an insufflation pressure of seven. They then increased the insufflation pressure further to 14 millimeters, which is at their center, the, the, the magnitude they used for pneumoperitoneum. And they uh, demonstrated an even further drop to 440 milliliters. Um, so this is a nice study sh that quantifies the, um, the decrease in portal vein flow that makes it quite easy to see. And you can understand why maybe the hepatocytes might leak a little bit of enzymes into the bloodstream, um, which uh, they do recover later, but it can be uh, significant. <clears throat> 
So now we can look at uh, pneumoperitoneum in, in the morbidly obese. Um, this is a uh, special population because they have uh, baseline elevated um, intra-abdominal pressures. So the average um, intra-abdominal pressure of a, of a non-obese person is uh, less than five millimeters of mercury. Uh, but in the morbidly obese, it, it can be uh, eight to nine. Um, so the morbidly obese and also the morbidly obese have uh, altered pulmonary mechanics as well. They have decreased pulmonary compliance. They have elevated peak airway pressures and decreased functional residual capacity. Um, so just a couple of numbers from the obese population. So uh, with the induction of pneumoperitoneum, end tidal CO2 rises uh, about 10 to 14 percent in the obese population. And uh, the global CO2 load increases by an impressive 30 percent. Um, now, anesthesia can compensate for this with increased minute ventilation, um, which actually had to increase 21 percent in one study of bariatric surgeries uh, in order to maintain normal capnia. We talked about elevation of liver enzymes, and this can be relevant in the um, the obese population, because many of them have steatohepatitis. In one study, 86% of patients undergoing um, bariatric surgery had uh, some degree of steatohepatitis. Um, another study looked at uh, pulmonary compliance during laparoscopic compared to open gastric bypass, um, and the pulmonary compliance intraoperatively uh, decreased by 42% during laparoscopic compared to 29% uh, during open gastric bypass. Also, we discussed the um, venous thrombosis and venous stasis risk. So this is um, <clears throat> very important in the obese population uh, who already, even without surgery, have a higher risk of venous thrombosis just to baseline venous uh, stasis. So uh, SCDs are very important and uh, consideration for uh, chemical DVT prophylaxis should be should be had. So important points from this lecture, I mean, the, a lot of this information is important to not just surgeons, but to anesthesiologists who are managing the physiology <clears throat> behind the curtain of the uh, patients undergoing pneumoperitoneum who may have COPD or be morbidly obese. Um, so, I mean, pneumoperitoneum in most patients who are healthy is, is safe and well tolerated. Um, as we've shown, uh, transient mild derangements in renal and hepatic function are expected and are not abnormal. So knowledge of pneumoperitoneum does become essential to the surgeon when the patients uh, have congestive heart failure, significant lung disease, cirrhosis. And <clears throat> lastly, uh, venous stasis and thrombosis is an important concern in the morbidly obese for the reasons we discussed. Um, so that's, that's all. Thanks. Instead of uh, quoting Lee, actually, it was uh, Phil Schauer with us who spent a year after his residency. Uh, when we did actually three papers. We looked at pulmonary function. Uh, we looked at the neuroendocrine response, mainly because there were a whole bunch of surgeons who looked at the four incisions and said, in skinny people, they could make a uh, poker incision about that big, and what's the difference between that and laparoscopic? So that's why we had to show the difference uh, between the open and the laparoscopic. Um, it all seems matter of uh, fact right now, 28 years later and 20,000 plus uh, procedures, but uh, for those of us that were in the trenches doing it originally, it was a pretty stressful event. Dr. Swessinger and I remember it a lot differently than Chris, our nurse, does. Uh, Chris came to work for us the day before we did our first lap coli, and if you want to know what it was like, just ask her because she remembers it minute by minute and hour by hour and exactly how it went. There were a lot of things that were unknown. Uh, one of the things you didn't mention is any contraindications these days. So there were a lot of patients we didn't do. One of them is if somebody has a patent foramen or if they have VSD or ASD, you worry about the embolus going over to the left side of the heart. 
we've looked at pregnant patients, but I don't think the circulation and the effect on the fetus has actually really been studied very well. I don't think we have any of our pediatric surgeons here, but I was asking Dr. Van Sickle, and we're not familiar with any papers that address that particular. Dr. Van Sickle, a victim of a laparoscopic minimally invasive surgery fellowship. Yeah, the pathophysiology of hemoperitoneum, uh, you'll get questions on this on your exam, uh, a lot of them. Uh, you see it clinically when patients go sort of instantly bradycardic when you just have the abdomen. Uh, the, probably the biggest follies are the varus needle follies, CO2 embolus is a pretty frequent question you'll get asked about. Um, the biggest problems really are the obesity related patients, you put them in reverse filter. Uh, I've heard stories from Houston that in the robotic cases where they're in steep Trendelenburg, they actually are required, the hospital makes them take them out of Trendelenburg at four hours. Some of these really prolonged hysterectomies or uh, low anterior resections because there's been reports of upper extremity DVTs and facial edema and CO2 getting in their subcutaneous space and causing temporary bronch blindness, all kinds of major problems. Fortunately, I've never been personally traumatized. We were a little jaundiced in our approach because our GYN colleagues had been doing this at this institution for about 12 years before we attempted this. And we had already been called in for puncture, various needle punctures to the vena cava, the left iliac vein, left iliac artery, uh, small bowel, colon, et cetera. So again, it was a a path that was very difficult to pioneer just because of what we had seen happen before. Dr. Muha actually had his license taken away. Uh, and our surgical endoscopy group here in this country recognized him uh, and gave him an award for his contributions about, what, five years ago, I think, at this time. So it was actually the French that went ahead and did it two years later and got all of the, all of the credit for it. Dr. Schlesinger, who was one of the founding members of SAGES, actually rejected the paper uh, submitted by the French. Uh, and instead of letting them present, they gave them a little corner room where they presented their video. And the whole meeting, 300 people were crowded into this little closet watching it. And the other thing that we always like to point out, you know, transplantation, the immunology started out in a test tube, and then animals, you know, and then clinical research. Uh, here, it went, it's a good thing, people demanded it, and the companies who made the equipment, the million dollar equipment, just forced it upon us. After we're doing it clinically, then we had to go back and prove some of the physiology and some of the pathophysiology, so it's kind of backwards of most contributions in American surgery these days. Dr. Stewart. In this terrific, terrific presentation, uh, you didn't mention anything, and I'd be curious if you, in, in preparing for it, uh, you found any uh, good quality data on it, on uh, the uh, new perineum probably decreases venous bleeding at the time of operation. So, 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 uh, so some people make a big deal about uh, uh, the insufflating and looking for bleeding. What, what's the data? Say with I, I didn't run into anything specifically related to that, although I, I have, I did note that too, but I didn't see any like therapeutic use of pneumoperitoneum for, for venous bleeding to stop it. Well, point. there is actually a therapeutic, I mean, it's crazy. I, I, I mean, I, I say this, George Velmos, I've, I've said it publicly, but uh, George is a great guy and, uh, and, and they, they basically for the past 15 years have tried to work on some some compressive, uh, uh, intra-abdominal compressive technique, which really came from this. It came from, it came from doing pneumoperitoneum, and they now have a, have a foam for it. But uh, uh, you know, you know, some people cited that uh, they had no bleeding, but then had post-op bleeding from, uh, for example, cholecystectomy because of uh, well, the, the 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 presumption was that uh, there was not bleeding at the time because of the pneumoperitoneum, and then there was. Afterwards, but no data. I didn't see any data that came up in my, my search on that. Just clinically, we normally desupplate in a watch as we take out the trocars, uh, but it's 
very, very rare. And the times that we've gotten into the trump cards, usually it's because we've gotten uh, heavy gas for our I think, I think the post op bleeding uh, uh, oftentimes, though, is because you under uh, recognize the permissive hypotension that your anesthesia team is providing for you. And things look great. And I'll tell you, when we're doing bariatric surgery, if I don't see some bleeding on the staple line, my first question to you is, what is the pressure? Because it shouldn't be super. I mean, I want it to be clean. And I want it to end up bleeding. But for it to not have bleeding means it's a little low. And we typically always have our pressure bumped up um, for a little bit to make sure just because of that. And I do think that the Pneumocare team is clearly helping with that with tamponade. But, uh, but you got to communicate on the other side of it. One of the other indicators for a CO2 or an air embolus is a rapid drop off in the end tidal CO2. That's one of the early indicators. So that does appear on test questions too. Any other questions? Dr. Kempenek? All right, thank you. This way I don't get bumped. This way I don't get bumped. <laughs>